with your love mountains high or valleys low you will never let me go by your fountain let me drink fill my thirsty soul glorious marvelous grace that rescued me Holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. Blessed Jesus, come to me as I fall down at your feet. Let me touch your nail-scarred hands, Jesus, I would see. Glorious marvelous grace that rescued me holy worthy is the lamb who died for me holy worthy holy worthy holy worthy Welcome to Twickenham. Really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us on the last Sunday of the year. So if you're a guest, welcome. Really glad you came to, to join us today. If you're traveling, we'll be praying for your safety and uh, safe travels. And if you're from town, just thanks for coming to be with us here this morning. Uh, we got Cade leading for us, uh, pitching in last minute because Lincoln, our Tua, turned up injured. And so we've got our own Jalen now to lead lead our worship for us. So. I know that you uh, enjoyed the college football playoffs yesterday. Uh, in case you don't know what that is, the college football playoff is where the four best, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> got a little choke right there, the four be <coughs> teams in college football playoff. And, um, so Alabama and Clemson, um, to everybody's shock and surprise, will be meeting a few days hence to, to finish, finish it off. Uh, the interesting thing about that is it, that for the most part, sports really is performance-based. It's really about merit. It's how you, unless you're Notre Dame, it's how you <laughs> perform. But with God, it's different. It's about grace. In fact, one of the most common phrases you'll hear in Scripture is, is one of the things that Paul says to Timothy. He says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord to you. Let's stand. We're going to sing about grace and peace this morning. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with all the justice, shines like the sun in 
all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is amazing love. This is amazing love. That you would take my place. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. That I would be set free. For oh, Jesus, I sing for all that she done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. You would take my place. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you would bear my cross. You let down your life. That I would be set free. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now. chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence 
so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's take our offering at this time as we sing. Who, O oh Lord, could save themselves, their own so good he. Our shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace is deeper still. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us. Let us out of death. To you alone belong the Your love goes further still. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us. Let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. You alone can rescue. You alone can you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. To you alone belongs the highest praise. One day you'll make everything do. Jesus, one day you will find every wound. The former things shall all pass away, no more tears. One day you'll make sense of it all. Jesus, one day every question resolved. Every anxious thought left behind, no more fear when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll see and shout the victory one day we will see face to face Jesus, is there a greater vision of grace? And in a moment we shall be changed on that day. And one day we'll be free, free indeed. Jesus, one day our struggle will cease. And we will see your glory revealed on that day. One day we will see face to face, Jesus, is there a greater vision of grace? And in a moment we shall be changed, yes, in a moment we shall be changed, in a moment we shall be changed, be changed. on that day.
will sing and shout the victory. Be seated. Be seated. Thank you. So they did this study with Olympic athletes. It's called counterintuitive, uh, counterfactual thinking. And uh, they asked them what if questions. They, they started with silver medalists and they said, what, what if, to the gymnast, they said, what if you had tucked your elbows in just a centimeter tighter and held it a millisecond longer so that your rotation was faster and you stuck the landing instead of having to take a step. They asked the, uh, a downhill skier, what if you had, had cut like a centimeter closer to the gate in the downhill and sped up that much more, cut that much off the, the course and crossed the finish line that much faster? They asked a sprinter, what if you had anticipated the shot of the gun and got out of the starting blocks two one-hundredths of a second faster. And after they asked them all of these what-if questions, the, the silver medalists felt worse about their medals than they had before because they realized just how close they had come to winning gold. The, the facts didn't change. Their perception of the facts changed, how they felt about the facts changed. And then they, then they asked uh, bronze medalists uh, the same kinds of questions. And when they finished with them, the bronze medalists felt better about their medals because they realized how close they had come to winning nothing at all. Perspective. All by asking a little two word, a question that begins with two words, what if? Counterfactual thinking. Historians do this all the time. Like, you've heard this before, what, what if the Japanese had not attacked Pearl Harbor? Or what if we had thwarted that attack? Or what if John Wilkes Booth had not shot President uh, Lincoln? Or if whomever really did it didn't shoot President Kennedy, right? Do the what ifs. I thought it would be interesting as we kind of close out this year to ask some what ifs ourselves. But I want to go further back than 2018 or 1960s. I want to go, or the 1860s. I want to go all the way back to the time of Jesus. And, and I thought of three what if questions that would be really interesting to ask about the life of Jesus. And, the, and the, the, doesn't change the facts, but it may change how we think about the facts. The first one, the first what if question comes right at the end of his ministry. Um, he's been in the garden praying. He's had, already had the last supper with his disciples. He's been in the garden praying. He's prayed the same prayer three times. Father, take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And three times God has said no to him. Uh, as an aside, if you kind of look back on 2018 and you feel some disappointment with God or maybe even some anger with God because God has not come through for you in a way that you wished he had. God has said no to something you wanted him to do. I don't know if this will help or not, but you're in good company because Jesus got no's from God at least three times and probably many, many more times. Anyway, Jesus comes back to his disciples and as he finds them sleeping, he sees a line of lanterns snaking its way through the trees in the garden. And Judas emerges into the clearing, one of his disciples, the betrayer, and he's flanked by uh, a, a group of uh, priests and temple guards. And the guards are armed and determined. They mean to be done with this troublemaker once and, once and for all. And so they move to arrest Jesus. And as they do, Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, whom we're going to talk about next week, Peter draws a sword. And I don't want you to think of a samurai sword or a cavalry sword. This is more like a 12 or 14 inch long dagger. It's not a big blade at all. So Peter draws his sword and he lunges for one of the men trying to arrest Jesus. And I believe he means to deprive the man of his head. But Peter is a fisherman, not a swordsman. And so all he manages to do is lop off an ear. And then Jesus, this is in Matthew 26, Jesus says something really interesting to Peter. He says, 
Put your sword back in its place. All who draw the sword die by the sword. You heard that phrase before? Those who live by the sword die by the sword? That's Jesus in the garden. And then Jesus says this to Peter. Do you not think that I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Peter, put your sword up. Put your dinky little 12-inch sword back in its sheath. Legions, 12 legions. A Roman legion was a, was a, a military unit, and it consisted of 5,000 soldiers. So 12 legions would be 60,000 angels pouring out of heaven if he wanted them to. Um, that sounds like a lot of firepower, and it is. Back in Isaiah chapter 37, one angel, one, was able to destroy 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. One angel, 185,000. So 60,000 angels, that's enough to wipe out 11 billion people. Right now, the population of the earth is just under 8 billion Back in Jesus' time, it's estimated that the population of the entire earth was around 300 million. So about the size of the United States population. If 60,000 angels, each of whom could kill 185,000 apiece, came out of heaven at his call, they could have depopulated the earth 36 times over. What if Jesus had made that call? There's another one, though, that's interesting, too. In fact, a little bit more interesting, if you ask me. This starts at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He, he goes to John the Baptist, and he, he says, by the way, you know John the Baptist was called John the Baptist not because he's Southern Baptist, right? <laughs> he's called John the Baptist. Not that there's anything wrong with that. He, he, he's called John the Baptist because he baptized people, right? So Jesus goes to him and says, I need to be baptized. Now, Put yourself in John's shoes, right? If, if Jesus came to you and said, hey, could you explain this Bible verse to me? I, I think what I would want to say is, you know what? I'm going to sit here and be quiet. You explain it to me, right? So Jesus comes to John and says, I, I need to be baptized. And John goes, I'm going to, why don't you baptize me? And then Jesus says, no, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness, which has always really fascinated me because Jesus felt like he had to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. If that's baptism is a part of your story, that's awesome. You're, that's something Jesus did. It sounds to me like you're following in his footsteps. If baptism is not a part of your story and your walk with God yet, you need to look at that. Jesus thought it was important. Take a look at those stories. Anyway, so after he's baptized, Jesus is driven into the wilderness by the Spirit of God, and for 40 days, he fasts and prays. And then he has an encounter with Satan. And Satan comes to him with three temptations. And interestingly, you can frame all these as what-if temptations. The first one attacks Jesus' physical hunger. I mean, he's been fasting, he's hungry, he needs a sandwich. And so Satan comes to him and says, here's a stone. What if you turn this stone into bread? Use your power for you. You're hungry. It's okay. Turn this stone into bread. And if I'd been Satan, I would have conjured up some of uh, the, 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 the scent, the aroma of some of Mary's home-baked biscuits. I would have just filled the air with that. But Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. No. It wouldn't have been a hard miracle. I mean, in a few weeks, he's going to turn water into wine. Later on, he'll take uh, two pieces of bread and five fish and make fish sandwiches for 5,000 people. This would have been easy. But he says no. And then Satan takes him to a, a high place, is what the Gospels call it, a high place, and shows him all the kingdoms of the world, all their glory and all their splendor. And this one, I think, is a temptation to a shortcut. What if you just skip all of that struggle, those trials, the beating, the cross? What if you skip all of that and just... Take a shortcut. All these kingdoms have been given to me. Look at them. Here's all the, here's all the glory, all the wealth, the architecture, the culture, the people, the music, the literature. All of it is mine. I give it to anybody if I want. What if you just bow down to me? I give you all that and you become king of the world right now. And Jesus says, 
No. And then Satan takes him to a temple, to the temple. And I think this one was the hardest one. He stands him up on, the, on a pinnacle of the temple, and basically he says, what if your dad isn't there for you like he promised he would be? What if daddy doesn't love you? Why don't we see? What if you jump off this pinnacle? Will he send his angels to keep you from dashing your foot against a stone, or will he let you splat? What if your daddy's not really there for you? And Jesus says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. No. What if he'd made a call to God to send those angels? What if he had taken the fall for one of those temptations? And then one more. We just finished celebrating the coming of Christ into the world, Christmas. Beautiful season, my favorite season. Matthew and Luke tell the story of, of the birth of Jesus. Matthew tells about the wise men and Herod. Luke tells about the shepherds and the old people, the sweet old people who bless Jesus. John doesn't have the Christmas story, but he does tell us where Christ was before Christmas. He says he was with the Father. Imagine that, perfect unity with God and the Spirit, perfect love, perfect place, harmony, beauty, Joy, no pain, no thirst, no sorrow, nothing, nothing negative at all. The perfect environment. What, what if Jesus had said, if, if I go down there, I have to, to borrow Paul's words, empty myself. And I have to become one of them. And that means that I will experience searing heat and bitter cold and gnawing hunger and insatiable thirst, I will know what pain is. I will feel it. Not just physical pain, but emotional pain. I'll know what loneliness is, and I'll know what sorrow is, and I'll know what sadness is, and I'll even know what anger is. I'll know all of the emotions. I'll face all of the temptations. I'll feel all of the pain. And then at the end of my story, They'll beat me to within an inch of my life. They'll nail me to a cross. They'll stick a crown of thorns on my head. When I finally die, they'll ram a spear into my side. Then they'll throw me in a hole and roll a rock over it. You know what? No thanks. I'm not going. What if he'd made a call to the angels? What if he'd taken a fall for one of those temptations? What if he had not come at all? Well, things would be a lot different, for sure. And for one thing, it wouldn't be 2018 right now if we were still on the Roman calendar, because our calendar is built right on the coming of Christ. B.C. is before Christ, A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. It's almost 2019 in the year of our Lord, A.D. But if we were still on the Roman calendar, it would be like 2771, because they dated their calendar from when the city of Rome was established. Or, or if Islam had become the dominant religion in the West, it would be 1396 because they date their calendar from when, from, from when Muhammad left Mecca and traveled to Medina. But those are just numbers. They really don't matter that much. The really big, the really big difference would be in how we relate to God. Every religion has some pathway to the ultimate Every religion has some way to get to God, the deity, or whatever, whatever they call it. Every one of them does, and they all operate on the ba same basic formula. You do this, and you get that. You do this, and you get that. Now, the this and the that are going to be different from one religion to the next, but it's all the same thing. It's all based on your performance. You have to merit that, and you merit that by doing this. Buddhism, if we had become Buddhist, if there'd been no Jesus, if he'd never come, if he'd made the call, if he'd taken the fall, if he'd never come at all, if he, and, and we had become Buddhist, our, our task here would be to achieve detachment from everything, because it's all an illusion anyway. And our goal would be to live in complete detachment. And the way you do that is by walking the noble eightfold path. 
And there are eight steps on the path, and every step begins with the word right. Right view, right um, speech, right action, right livelihood, on and on and on. I looked at that. I fell off the path after the second step. Actually, I fell off on the first step. And if you fall off the path, karma. The, the goal is, is to achieve nirvana, but you only get that if you do this. Walk the noble eightfold path. It's all about performance. If Hinduism had become the dominant religion in the West and we were Hindus, we would be a part of a, a very noble, beautiful religion, and we would believe that everything is cyclical, that, that when you die, you're just reborn into another existence. You are reincarnated into another existence. And the neat thing about Hinduism, it's kind of like Groundhog Day. You get to keep doing it over and over and over until you get it right, which sounds kind of appealing, except that there's a twist. And the twist is the, bad, the consequences for the bad things you did in a previous existence are visited upon you in this one. So it's not only based on how you perform now, it's also based on how you performed in previous incarnations. And some of you are thinking, if that's true, I must have been a really bad person way back when because wow. But if you, if you finally get all that, then if you finally get it right, then you achieve enlightenment. But again, it's based on your performance. Islam may have become the dominant religion in the West. And it's pretty simple. Submit. It's all about submission. Doesn't really matter what's in your heart, doesn't really matter what's in your head. All that matters is what you do. And if you submit to Allah, then you get paradise. And if you don't, then you get destruction. And there are not any second chances. Even, even Judaism, our, our forefathers and mothers in, in faith, even Judaism is based on your performance. There's only one religion that breaks the formula. In Christianity, in the religion that Jesus established, it's not you do this and you get that. It is God did this so you could have that. God came and did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He performed where we could not so that we could have a connection with God. God did this so we could get that. Uh, if you're one of the guys that's going to serve communion, now would be a great time for you to go to the back. We tried to find a more subtle way to do that, but I was not a really good third base coach, and these guys missed the signs all the time anyway. So, Here's what it's like with the religion of Jesus. You remember the story of the kids that got trapped in that cave in Thailand earlier this year? It was in June. It went from like June to July, 18 days where nobody really knew what was going on or we, we were all tense. Here, here's how that happened. These kids had practice, 12 of them and their coach had practice, and then they all decided to go to the cave in, in northern Thailand. And, and this is a place these kids went all the time. So when they didn't come home for dinner that night and the parents started checking around, they all, the parents knew where to look. They all went to the cave and they saw the kids' bicycles and they saw the kids' backpacks and they stepped into the mouth of the cave and they realized to their horror what had happened. The cave was filling up with water and they knew that the kids and the coach were somewhere deep in that cave. And so they called the local authorities and the local authorities couldn't do anything with it. So they called the regional authorities and they came and looked and said, this is too big for us. And they called the Thai military, the army and the navy. And even the Thai military said, this is, we, we got nothing. And so they began reaching out to cave rescue experts around the world. And they found people in Australia and in Japan and in Germany and Russia and France and Britain and the United States. And pretty soon, within, within days, hundreds of people were, were gathering in this remote Thai village to figure out how to find these kids and get them out. They sent in a couple of British cave divers, and the interviews with the divers were really interesting. They, one of the divers explained, when you, when you go into a cave to rescue, really it's, you're going in to recover. 
And the way you find people is you swim through one of the, the flooded tunnels and you emerge in a cavern and you take your mask off and you smell. And what you're smelling for is decomposition. And so, and so that's what we did. We would swim, we would surface, we would smell, and we would submerge and swim again. They swam two and a half miles into the cave, two and a half miles into the cave. And they surfaced and they found the boys and their coach on a ledge in a flooding cavern. Water's coming up, the oxygen was going down. And the divers said, so glad we found you. We will get you out, not knowing how they were going to do that. The divers swam back out, and the, and the experts sat around and talked about it. A lot of ideas were, were put forth. Somebody said, we can, we can dig, dig a tunnel down to them. And they thought, that's too much rock, too far. We'll never get there in time. Somebody else said, let's pump the water out. And so they brought in pumps, dozens of pumps, and they pumped water, and they pumped water, but they, they could never get enough out. And so finally they realized the only way they were going to get those kids out was to go in and get them and swim them out themselves. One of the divers was asked, were you confident you could get the boys out? And he was a British guy, and he said, oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely positive I could get them out. Got to get them out alive. Not so confident. The, the leader of the mission actually said, after it was over with, he said, we were prepared to accept casualties. Four, five, eight, all. Actually, one, they all actually lost one Thai Navy SEAL who ran out of oxygen in one of the flooded tunnels. When they reached the boys, they sedated them because the last thing you need when you're swimming through a three-foot tunnel underwater is for the kid to panic. So they sedated them, and the kids were absolutely helpless as they pulled them out. But over a period of 18 days and hundreds of thousands of dollars and 10,000 volunteers from around the world, all 12 boys and their coach were finally rescued. Now you listen. This is for me and this is for you. If Jesus had made that call and angels had poured out of heaven to save him from the cross, if Jesus had taken the fall for any one of those temptations, if he hadn't come at all, you and I are those boys in that cave. No way out. No way could we swim out of that prison and reconnect with our God. We would be eternally, permanently, forever separated. The gospel, the good news is he came in and got us out. You take that with you, and as you think about the what-ifs for the future, know that that one has been answered for you. Let's pray, and let's share this bread, a reminder of his body. God, we're thankful for all the times you said no to Jesus, and all the times he denied himself. We're thankful that he came that he lived a sinless life and that even though he could have, he did not call for all those angels to come and save him from the cross because he wanted to save us from our sin. We receive this bread as a part of your creation and we take it as a reminder of the body that was broken so that we could be created anew. Thank you for this bread. In Jesus' name, amen.
The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Be still, my soul, redeeming love. Out of the dust of Calvary is rising to the throne above. There is no vengeance in his crime. While it is finished, fills the sky. Forgiveness is the final plea. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. My heart can barely take it in. He pardons all my guilty stains. Surrender all my shame to him. He breaks the curse of every shame. My sin is great, but greater still. The boundless grace his heart reveals a mercy deeper than the sea. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the cup. Uh, this reminder of the blood that speaks for us, the blood that was shed for us. We are thankful that Jesus was willing to go to such extravagant lengths to make it possible for us to connect with you. We thank you for looking away so that you could turn your face toward us we do not deserve this, but we are grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. When my accuser makes the claim that I should die for my offense, I point him to that rugged frame where I found life at Christ's expense. See from his hands, his feet aside, the fountain flowing deep and wide. Oh, we did shout the victory. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Worthy is the Lamb, Lamb for sinners slain. Jesus, Lord of all, glory to his name. Heaven crying out, let the earth proclaim. Power in the blood, glory to his name, Jesus. Oh, let my soul arise and sing, my confidence is not in vain. The one who fights for me is he, his hope is His 
word will stand, I stand redeemed. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Amazing love, how can it be? The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Hey, thanks for being here today. I want to share a couple of quick announcements with you. Um, not this Wednesday night, but a week from Wednesday on January 9th, we're going to start um, a new Wednesday evening program just for January called The Summit. Now, I know it's hard to get here on Wednesday nights, so we're going to make it a little bit harder. We're going to start a little bit earlier, uh, 6 o'clock. We're going to provide a, a light meal, and if it's not, it, it probably won't be enough. For, for your dinner that night. There's Chick-fil-A close by, okay? Uh, but it'll be enough to get you through so you can come straight from work or bring the kids that will have some, some food here. And then from 6.20 to 7.30, we're gonna meet together in the fellowship hall, but it's not gonna be sit and get. You know, I'm not gonna stand there or Steve or somebody else is gonna stand there and, and lecture. You're gonna be engaged in conversation with each other. Yeah. We're gonna walk through some questions together as we try to really figure out what God is calling us to be as a church. This is part of our vision process. It's always hard to get to the summit, but it's always worth the climb. Really, look, I don't want you to be there if you don't want to be there. Okay, let me just be real honest with you. If you don't want to be there, okay. But we really want you to be there. We want you to want it because we think this can be a really good event for us. Wednesday nights, beginning on January 9th. Okay, a couple of other things here. The office is closed uh, until the 3rd, I think, or the 2nd. What day we open back up? Do we know? The day after New Year's, right? The 2nd, okay. So don't come see us until the 2nd. Um, ladies' movie night, Friday, January 11th. The ladies' ministry will be getting together to watch a movie in the war room. And there's a baby shower in the Mercy Building on the 13th. This is all right here, okay? Take a look at the back of that little program you got. If you didn't get one... Pick one up on your way out. Matt Bender, you're here. Matt's going to lead us in the closing prayer. Let's stand. Say hi to folks around you when he's done with a prayer. Glad you were here. Happy New Year. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for sending Jesus, your son, here to die for our sins. We're not worthy, uh, but um, we just... Uh, Thank you, and we pray that that sacrifice will be foremost on our minds, God, uh, throughout this week, throughout this next year. We thank you for the new year. Uh, we ask, God, what if we put uh, Jesus first in all of our thoughts, in all of our relationships, uh, in all the decisions that we make, God? And we know, uh, we thank you for Jesus who, who shows us what that looks like. God, I pray for this church as we're, we're figuring out our vision for not just this coming new year, but for the next 20 years. I pray that uh, you'll give the elders wisdom, that you'll give all of us wisdom, uh, that we will truly be your hands and feet in this community, God, that you'll get all the praise and glory. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.